Hey everybody, how are you? I hope the Yard Coach crew is hitting on all eight cylinders and your week has been as stress-free and productive as possible. I really do. Hey, this week we are talking about landscape edging. The pros, the cons, some of the materials and the installation styles and techniques that uh, go into it. Curious though, do you guys have landscape edging right now in your landscape? And if so, how does it look? And how is it performing for you? You know, drop me a comment or send me an email or, you know, send up a smoke signal. Let me know, won't you? I'm kind of curious. So with that being said, let's get a little edgy, shall we? A little edgy. Hey, I'm Matt. You can call me coach. Every Friday, I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself, get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys, the new, modern, educated, self-reliant homeowner of today. Hey, to kick things off, right up front, I will tell you that not all people use edging in their landscapes. Either they live on property that is so large, it is just horribly impractical, or maybe they like a natural edge look, which we will discuss and I have subscribed to off and on over the years. You know, traveling about our US of A lately, just a bit now, I have seen many, many styles of landscape from the, hmm, yeah, you gotta start over landscapes, to a, oh my God, 20 acres of ornamental lusciousness. But out of all of those, I think only about 50% had a definitive landscape edging installed. The rest were made up of a variety of landscape styles, including the edging that does not even exist. So what is, what is your opinion? What is your opinion on landscape edging? You think it's something that's needed? I know out west, I know out west where I practiced a lot, it was, it was pretty prevalent, you know, and having incorporated several styles of edging in hundreds and hundreds of landscapes over the years, I have learned to see the use and in many cases, the non-use of edging in general. So let's look at the purpose. What is the purpose of landscape edging? Well, you know something by my <laughs> humble landscape designer, contractor opinion, I kind of define it as this, and that is uh, any organic or non-organic material that serves as a separation barrier between two parts of a landscape. Not really complicated, right? I mean, it's really not. Now, for most of us, we instantly, instantly form that thought of edging as the landscape material between a lawn area and a planting bed and never the two shall meet, right? Keep the lawn in the lawn and the plants in the plants, period. That's a basic concept of landscape edging. In general, this is all true. You know, landscape edging is and does serve as those barriers. But why, why do we landscape this way? Well, it boils down to a couple of reasons, really. First reason would be because it has always been done that way in the area or region we have lived in. In other words, kind of traditional. The second, because there is a specific need based on the plant material we have chosen to use and you need to create a barrier. Here's a for instance. The housing developments where I did business, at least about 90%, if not more of them, all had landscape edging installed. The developments, you know, the, the rubber stamp houses, you know, the typical suburbia, the developments usually had pre-installed front yards as a way to sell their houses. We called them in the business production jobs. They were just basically rubber stamped landscapes, down and dirty, usually each yard was done in less than a day, oftentimes two yards a day, and they had the exact, pretty much the exact same plants in the exact same place with the exact same sod and the exact same everything. They all had edging. Most of it was created from flexible composite one by four material which I will discuss in a few minutes, so hang in there. Then there are landscapes I have seen where the lines between nature and ornamental domesticated yards are really kind of blurred. Edging is not present at all, except in the form of 
where the weedy grasses are mowed short versus the weedy grasses that are left tall and grow on their own. Basically, ma nature surroundings. That's an edging. I mean, the edging is done with a, a mower and it's not a definitive line, it's just a mowed line. Edging is not even a concept in these areas. And some places, particularly in, shall I say, east of the Mississippi River here in the USA, there are, there are yards that have tens upon tens of thousands of square feet of what you would uh, term as the turf area. And then usually around the house, very close to the house, almost foundation-like, there would be some ornamental plant material and then the house itself. But a lot of the landscape was turf. And it's not irrigated turf. This is water from the sky type of irrigation, and that is it. And we're talking places that I saw that had acres of what they would consider turf area. Now, who in the hell is going to place edging on that scale? Now, there are some people out there. And if they do, they probably carry the last names of like Gates, Bezos, or Musk. You get my meaning? It just wouldn't make any sense. You'd be talking tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of dollars if you went on the cheap. And if you went on the higher end type of edgings, you'd talk hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like I said earlier, edging was a staple diet where I worked. Most of the materials I used were based on my customer's budget. Higher end landscapes generally received a cement edgings and the more budget conscientious received composite or maybe wood or in some cases none at all. So when we talk about materials used, I will cover the top few. I don't know if I'm gonna get into more than five or six. It is always only a few clicks away to find an edging material that interests you and works for you based on long-term success. And that long-term success will always be grounded in good installation practices. So before we get into materials, let me say this. Landscape edging is a luxury item in the ornamental landscapes. It is not a mandatory element. You make the decision whether it is needed. Incorporate it into your budget. And if it fits, great. If it's not, okay, it's okay as well. So let's look at the first one. It's one that I've used many, many times. Now remember, I, I worked and practiced in Northern California for many, many years. The cement edging generally comes in two forms, formed and poured edgings or molded curbing, molded cement curbing. Cement edging is a durable, long lasting landscape edging when done right. It can be done in the most basic of fashions, or in some cases, really, really gooch the hell up with colored concrete and stamping textures put onto it. And you know, the sky's the limit, as long as you got the checkbook. It is the more expensive end of the landscape edging spectrum. Also, very time consuming. Hence, if you hire professionals, the cost that goes involved. Basically, all the time, all the time, it's kind of like a lot of other things. It's all in the prep work, kind of like painting a house. It's all in the prep work. The forming, the forming of these edgings is the most time consuming and the most important part of putting in concrete edging. The pouring and finishing are the easiest part of the task. It really is. Now the cement curbing is popular for a number of reasons. The very first reason, <laughs> what do you think it is? That's right because others do it because you don't have a you don't have a curbing machine and you don't have the finishing tools to do it so others do it that's why they're so popular second it has a nice look to it and can be formed into different styles depending on your taste you could have the the standard rectangular flat curb you can have the angular sloped style or you can have what i used to call the the high low it's a stepped curbing where it has a steep back on it and it slopes down to a slightly flat area, which would be the grade of your lawn, then it goes down to the, the curve. Check it out over on YouTube because I'm gonna have specific, specific examples so you can understand exactly what I'm talking about. I use this uh, preformed curving many times, but I did an extra step which minimized having to do a few other steps. Curbing is usually placed on kind of a a really thin skim coat of sand or similar material on the top of the ground. 
and this curbing is placed right on top of the ground 99% of the time, unless she came and did a job at Coach's job site. This generally means that the edging is much higher than the lawn area, either the existing lawn or the to-be lawn area. Now that complicates things just a little bit. It, uh, say that for instance, you go and you go and spend the money and have some preformed curbing put in around your your lawn area, and your lawn area is fine. But now you've got this this curb that is two inches, two and a half inches higher than your lawn. You have a really nice defined edge. How the hell are you gonna mow it? You know, all you're going to be doing is running your mower wheels right up to the curbing or taking a string trimmer and having to not just edge the lawn, but actually trim the lawn a few inches out because your lawn mower isn't going to work, not right up against it. So what did I used to do? Well, in the preparation for my lawn areas, I used to always go in and rototill and incorporate compost and fertilizer and other things so the lawn really had a, a great start. I never, I never had to go back and replace lawns ever, except for one, and that wasn't my fault, that was the customer's fault. Remember, you get a brand new landscape? Yeah, don't turn off your irrigation timer and then fly to Fiji for two weeks. Not a good idea. Most of the time, especially in July, yeah, that, they came back to a dead lawn and wanted to blame me. That's a whole nother story, anyway. So what I used to do is when I did this preparation for the lawn, I would basically dig down or excavate out the edge of where the lawn was gonna be. And I pulled the dirt away and then I had the guys come in and put in their curbing. And it was kind of set down about two inches. Then the excavated soil, once the curbing was dry, I would push back against it and I'd be able to put my sod in. And then the customer had irrigation and lawn at the grade of the curbing. So if you guys end up doing the curbing, you have someone come in and do it, then make sure you kind of excavate it down just a little bit. They're gonna to try to get you not to do it because all they wanna do is get in there and put their skim, their, their, their skim coat of sand down, put the curbing down, get your check and blast because they've got another job or two that day. But a little bit of prep work on your behalf will really go a long way. So before we go on to the next material, so what are some of the cons, coach? What are the cons about using a cement type product? Well, I guess the, the, the first con, they are susceptible to a few things, unless really reinforced well. One is root heave from trees with less, you know, trees that are, have less than good manners. Say like uh, redwoods, ash, uh, sycamore, um, willow, and some other ones, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm leaving a few out, but basically they, they kind of stay up at the top of the soil, especially around a turf area, because they don't want to work too hard. Hey, all the water is right there at least two, three, four, five times a week. So why do they need to put deep roots down? And sometimes they'll, they'll go underneath a cement curbing or a uh, preformed curbing, and they'll lift that stuff straight the hell up and it'll crack it, and it'll make it ugly. And over time, as those trees or tree get bigger, uh, the problem just magnifies. So the other is northern latitudes issue, uh, like north of the 45th parallel. Oftentimes you can get frost heave. So how do you combat this kind of cracking and heaving is reinforcement. If you have a, a formed and poured, make sure you put in a 3 8 rebar or something that's really going to hold that stuff and make it very, very strong. You want it strong enough that you can walk around and jump on it. Uh, if you can put a ride-on mower on it, you don't have to worry about it cracking. It's going to have to be at least three inches thick and at least, at least six inches wide. And I always, always never had concrete edging any thinner than nine inches. And most of them were nine to 12 inches. At Weed Patch, the last, the last house that I had, it was uh, 12 inches. You know, and you could literally walk on it like a narrow walkway. I never had to worry about it because it was, it was put in correctly. It really was. So we talk about uh, frost heave. We talk about root heave. Finally, for port edging, it is the time. Time and cost. Forming it, leveling it side to side so that your, your sides are going to be, you know, relatively level. And regrading. It all takes time. Setting irrigation to proper grade with your new edging, considering the pour. Plus, if you do a grade level edge, grade level edge there's like I told you about the guys come in they just want to put it right on top of the soil if you don't then you have this backfill that you're going to have to do 
you're going to have to bring in some additional soil and bring that grade up to meet your new edging. Otherwise, you're going to have that mowing complication that I mentioned. But in the right setting, ladies and gentlemen, in the right setting and done correctly, cement products will last almost forever. It will never rot out like wood. It will never swell and heave from heat like another edging I'm going to tell you about and will not have wooden stakes that rot away and is great for mowing with either a push or ride on mower. I really suggest that you heed the warning about reinforcement. Now in the, the preformed cement curbing, you can always ask for reinforcement and they put like a, a fiberglass reinforcement in there that'll, that'll do a pretty darn good job. You generally can't put rebar in that stuff. So they'll put in some uh, cold joints with their little uh, tool. It'll cost you a little bit more but put in the fiberglass reinforcement. So what is another product? Well, let's talk about the metal edging. It's generally a four inch edging in width, and then in thickness, they're generally about a little over an eighth of an inch. So it's kinda, kinda flexible. Generally comes in like 10 or 20 foot lengths. Usually comes in a black or a green color. And usually they join with uh, thin stakes or pins that go between each piece and you can set these down in. Now some actually have teeth on one end of them and you can actually pound it down into the turf depending on what you have. You know, you can literally take a rubber mallet and or a, a small two pound sledge with a, a wood insulator and you can tap that stuff down in. Have I used it? Yes, I have used it. I have used it a few times. It was not prevalent where I practiced, not at all. Uh, my personal opinion is it virtually kind of disappears. You know, most of the time edging is an aesthetic accent to a landscape, especially the smaller suburban type of landscapes. But the skinny little stuff, really, you can't see it once you pop it down in there. And with that, depending on what kind of turf area you have, if you're putting it in around a turf, a lawn area, you kind of have to be really cognizant of where it's at so that you don't mower strike it and end up with problems. Now the, the middle edging can be installed for the purpose of lawn and bed separation, or it can be for bed and gravel separation, more of a on, on the grade level type of stuff. Uh, you may have gravel out in front of it and then a mulched bed with plants behind it. it doesn't always have to be just for lawn. Just be aware of that. It, there are there is that option out there. It is kind of pricey. Uh, it's not as much as concrete, and but it's more than wood or composite. And speaking of composite, let's talk about composite edging. This product came on the market quite a few years ago, back in the 90s. It was produced by uh, the Epic Company, EPIC. They're the only ones I know of that actually put it out there. It was grounded and based on the recycle reuse philosophy. A large part of the makeup of the product was from recycled plastics, milk jugs, everything, any kind of recycled plastic. This is what they used mixed with other materials and then color and then through a huge heat related extrusion process it would kick out this one by four or two by four size composite edging. I actually got to tour the factory, which was, was near the hometown where I worked in Lodi, California. And it was kind of neat to see, kind of neat to see the process. And I've used, boy, I tell you what, I have used and installed thousands and thousands of feet of this product over the years. The product is really good. In theory, it's really good. Uh, but the anchoring has, uh, basically keeping it in place, it has kind of a limited shelf life in my humble opinion. Either the wood stakes or the composite stakes through uh, cold and hot and landscape roots and other things, it will tend to, it will tend to come apart and raise up after a while. It really will. Uh, resulting in a, in a, you have to go out and reset it, dig it out a little bit and reset it, restake it. And yeah, you got to do that probably I don't know, every three to five years, depending on your soil conditions, weather trends, root situations. I used to use the one by four a lot for a tighter, tighter radiuses around lawns and stuff. And then I would double it. I would usually give it a, a two by four look for durability and for longevity. And then I would do it one at a time. I would put in one whole edge and then I would come back and put in another edge. Don't try to do it with that one by four and try to put it down uh, together. It will not work because you have an 
inner radius and an outer radius, and the outer radius is going to take more material, and it just doesn't work. You'll end up with problems. So, how about another? How about some of the stuff that you see at the box stores? There's the black plastic edging with kind of a circular tubular top on it. There is the really thin, thin, thin composite stuff that's out there. I got to be honest, nothing against the companies that put this stuff out. I have taken more of these products out of landscapes and put in something a little more durable and long lasting. I just have to kind of take a hard pass only because I've seen them destroyed so easily with mowers and string trimmers. They just don't last. They don't last at all. And sometimes that's because of poor installation practices. And other times they just get beat the hell up, mainly from mowers, mainly. So what are some other options? Well, kind of paralleling the cement edging, there's always brick. Brick is an option that will last many, many years but is all based on proper installation and yearly weather conditions. There are a couple of ways that are the most common installation methods. One of them is horizontal placement. Horizontal, you know, you can literally lay a brick flat on the ground and then on the back side of it, you put a brick on edge. And you do this through the whole curvature of whatever edging, whatever radius, whatever you're doing. And the one that lies flat should be at grade of the existing or going to be lawn area. And then the one vertical behind it is kind of a uh, support feature and also stands a little taller so that your planting bed has a place for mulch to come up to it and plant material and color and whatever else you decide to do. Remember, check out the YouTube channel. I will show you exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's hard to actually paint the picture just in words unless you see it. I always suggest that if you do some tight turns, you may have to uh, you may have to do a couple of brick cuts just to make it look really good rather than just putting them flat and you're going to have those space that that radius space. So occasionally you might have to learn how to cut a brick and you can get a masonry blade and put it on your circular saw and, and do them pretty easy. They're, it's not too hard. So another way to use in brick is um, basically putting down the old formed and poured cement edging like I did at the top of the materials part of this show. And then on the top of that, then you put a brick veneer, whatever color you want, used brick or red brick or tan brick or whatever you want to do. And then you mortar that on top of the cement edging. Now you're talking a little bit of gooch and a little bit of price done, done by yourself, which is hope, hopefully who I'm talking to. Yeah, it's a little pricey, it's a little time consuming, but if you're not under the gun and you can take your time in doing it, probably get the edging done one weekend, like you form it on a Saturday, maybe you pour it the next Saturday, and then a couple Saturdays later, you know, you go down and get some brick veneer and some mortar and make it up and butter those downsides and put it on there and learn how to do it. It'll, it'll, come, out, it'll come out pretty nice, it really will. And then you have the options of colors, you know, to choose from, etc. Lastly, let's talk about no edging. No edging at all. A natural edge to whatever it might be between lawn and planting bed. I think out of all the edging I've ever done, a lot of the edges, especially against turf or stuff, especially against planting beds, it was always walkways and patios. They were the biggest driveways, were the biggest edgings that I ever put in. And they were used, you know, quite a bit. They really were. Just the little, the little stuff like we've talked about here, probably made up about 50% of the landscape edging, but a lot of the major landscape elements that served as an edging were walkways, driveways, etc. So to get kind of creative now, Let's talk about the last few, and I'm not going to go into depth, but you can think about cobblestones. Kind of hard to edge around, but you can get up close with the mower and come back with a string trimmer. You can do, you can use cobblestones. Generally the kind of the five by nine size, maybe three by five size, but uh, I would go bigger. Then there's finished timbers, four by four, two by four, railroad ties, six by sixes. I would definitely suggest pressure treated and I would definitely suggest that the soil contacted portions of your your wood timbers get an extra coat of preservative on them 
and then you sink them down in the ground and, and use them however you want. Generally, these are kind of relegate you to kind of angular, angular edges, square, rectangular, 45s, 22 degrees, you know, things that you can cut fairly easy, but uh, been around for a long time and you can still, still do a great job. And they'll last for quite a while. If you put in some preservative and stuff on them and you anchor them down correctly, you can get uh, good pressure treated stuff to last a decade or more before you really have to start replacing, I guess. All in all, landscape edging is a great addition to a finished ornamental landscape. You know, they create formality, they create separation and no mingling between creepy crawly grasses and ground covers and that kind of stuff. So you don't have, you know, if you have a Bermuda lawn or you have a centipede grass lawn or any of the crawly grasses, the edging will slow down and keep the grass in the grass and the plants in the plants. And you don't have to get that mingling. You know, that's what we talked about. That's the purpose. Super large landscapes, nah, they just basically escape these tasks. But smaller, more suburban or urban landscapes they're really quite common and in many cases needed to make it look right. Hey, so let me know what your situation is and if you have edgings or edging problems uh, of one kind or another, I'd really appreciate some feedback. Hey, that is what I have for you on this show this week. I hope you uh, kind of picked up what I was putting down. I hope you understand about it. Hope you maybe take on the task of putting some in or fixing what you do have. If you stayed with me through this episode, consider subscribing, you know, and following along every single week, not only here on the podcast, but check out the YouTube channel as well. I promise every episode you will learn something valuable regarding your landscape every single show. They're not always really short shorts, you know, sometimes they're a half hour show, but what better education and free education do you want? I will never sacrifice quality for time. I really won't. As always, guys, to your landscape success. I will see you guys next week. See you over on the YouTube channel. Don't forget the website. As always, got a couple of great products for you there. Always help support Coach and the work that Maestro and I do here. You guys take care. See you next week. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. Don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified and the flagship digital course Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.